It's a real pleasure and an honor to be invited by the Heritage Lab to speak in connection with the Indian Heritage Online campaign that has done such amazing work to make images pertaining to India's cultural heritage available online on Wikimedia Commons. My name is Shujan, and I'm a researcher, writer, and translator based in Kolkata, currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. In this talk, over the next half an hour or so, I'll speak about a sizable selection of postcards related to Calcutta, drawn largely from Omar Khan's Paper Jewels project and the Tux database of postcards, now accessible via Wiki Commons thanks to this project. There are a number of ways in which scholars have engaged with postcards. Some, like Naomi Shore and Saloni Mathur, for instance, have offered excellent insights on cultures of collecting postcards and on the gender dynamics. Uh, others, such as my earlier project as an India Foundation for the Arts Archiving Fellow based at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, read them among a host of other visual material as integral to understanding the emergence of the tourism industry. The talk today will focus primarily on the visual elements and styles of these postcards while acknowledging the important constitutive role played by the modes of production, circulation, and collection. In the first section, I'll try to briefly trace the postcard's rapid rise to popularity around the turn of the 20th century and its impact on users. The second section will contextualize postcards of cityscapes in a longer tradition of visual representations of the city and explore the links between paintings, photographs, and postcards. I will conclude with a brief survey of the other genres of postcards that were popular and alternative imaginings of the form by Indian artists. So the first section is titled, The Picture Mad Age. Let's start by looking at the earliest Calcutta postcards in the collection. Made in Austria, presumably because a lithograph lithography was quite advanced there, these cards were produced for one W. Rosler, a Calcutta-based photographer in the late 1890s. They are similar in their appearance to this uh, genre of postcards that were called greetings from postcards. So greetings from the place of the name would be followed uh, by that, uh, which through their direct association with the place from which they would be typically posted were instrumental in launching the postcard industry, according to historian Frank Staff. Each card in the Rosler series, as you can see here, features a collage of four images pertaining to Calcutta, usually. They include one Hindu deity. We have seen Kali, Durga, Ganesh, and Ganga. Examples of European architecture. So here you see the Raj Bhavan, um, the High Court here. Ethnographic representations of Indian professions and sacred sites, like the Kali Ghat Temple or the Burning Ghat. Here you see a picture of an Aya. Um, and, and occasionally rituals that uh, almost invariably uh, had this kind of orientalizing and voyeuristic gaze. Uh, one of the most remarkable objects in the series is this one, which is a Christmas and New Year greeting from December 1898, signed by W. Rossler himself and sent to one Karl Hatta in Bohemia. Interestingly, the curatorial note, which is also uh, available on Wiki Commons, observes that pre-1900, quote, postcards from India seem to have been most often sent to Central European countries like Austria, Germany, France, and Hungary, unquote, whereas postcards addressed to recipients in Britain start appearing in larger numbers after 1900. Uh, the cause, I'm not very sure what, I mean, why this would be, but there are two things to note here. The first is a methodological point, and I'm saying this because, uh, you know, since this uh, very large collection has become available, it's, it's also possible for people to um, study them in, in, in various ways. So the first is the methodological point, which is to say that in the absence of adequate archival record related to the production and circulation of postcards, scholars are forced to tease out every little clue that may be found on a card to situate it historically. 
So a close look at the image and historical familiarity with the depicted landscape might also help in dating a postcard by the presence or absence of a particular structure. For example, even in the absence of other evidence, we would be able to date this postcard that you see here to post-1902 because that is when Viceroy Curzon rebuilt the memorial to the Black Hole Incident of 1756 when Nawab Siraj Dalla, the Nawab of Murshidabad, had imprisoned inhabitants of the English Fort William in a dungeon leading to many deaths. The publishing information usually contains a few obvious clues, although quite often, given the lack of archival records, they turn out to be the only clues to the existence of some company or distributor. So it, it, it can very well happen that you find the name of a publisher and uh, by looking it up on Google or in other archives, you don't find any other information except for the fact that they were postcard publishers. And that's what you can derive from the postcard itself. Uh, the sender's message and the stamp can also offer some uh, very useful hints, including possible allusions to the collecting practices of the recipient. Um, a remarkable instance of this is found in a postcard from Sorab Sabawala written in April 1905. So uh, again, the great thing about this collection is that Wikimedia Commons actually makes available what's written on the verso as well. Here it says, Dear Sir, your PPC, that is picture postcard at hand. I shall be pleased to exchange cards with you, but I want cards of your famous galleries, pictures, and paintings of great masters, cards showing statues and fine works of art only. I do not collect ordinary city views. In return, I shall send you cards of beautiful mosques, mausoleums, temples, and tombs in which my country is so very rich. The other point uh, to note from this is, is a historical one that these postcards from the late 1890s contain images and space for the message on the same size, as you see here. So why is that and when did it change? The postcard, Saloni Mathur writes, originated, quote, as an epistolary innovation rather than a visual one. So the initial purpose would have been to communicate rather than, uh, rather than the visual message that it conveyed. At the suggestion of an Austrian post, car, post office official, Dr. Emanuel Hermann, thin and buff colored cards were introduced in Austria in 1869. So just to quickly do a recap of the history of uh, the picture postcard. Through the 1870s, most European countries adopted these postal mailing cards, as uh, Mathur describes them, and private companies were gradually allowed to produce them so long as they adhered strictly to the rules laid down by the government. On one side would appear the words postcard and the address only to be written on this side. So uh, the reverse would contain only the address. Since these cards weren't really, you know, as we would call it today, end-to-end -end encrypted, there were concerns regarding privacy. Postal authorities were empowered to refuse delivery if, quote, obscenities or libellous remarks, unquote, were found on the card. So, uh, I mean, the question obviously arises that uh, how, how does the postal authority claim to not read them, to, to maintain that sense of privacy and censor them? So you can't have one without the other, but anyway. Um, printed pictures started appearing only in the 1880s but technological advancements in image reproducibility soon ensured the primacy of the visual. In 1902, what happens is that the format gets changed. The space at the back would accommodate both message and address with the front containing only the image. So if we look at say a postcard like this, you see that, you know, this is the divided postcard. So you have both the message and the address on one side, including a, a kind of caption, I mean, series number, etc., on the back and the image on the front side. So in a sense, the front and the back also becomes somewhat clearly distinguishable. As with most new technology, postcards quickly found detractors. In September 1905, we find one George Sims complaining in the picture postcard magazine that, quote, 
You enter the railway station and everybody on the platform has a pencil in one hand and a postcard in the other. In the train, it is the same thing. Your fellow travelers never speak. They have little piles of picture postcards on the seat beside them and they write monotonously. So, um, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, there are so many sort of campaigns now that nostalgically try to revive this practice of postcard writing, yet at the time when it was becoming popular, it was, um, it, it certainly irked some uh, people. It's such a familiar complaint in a sense, you know, books, postcards, mobile phones, all with this dubious capacity to dissociate the individual from their immediate surroundings and connect them to imagined communities through technology. The craze was fueled by the postcard companies too. So they fully recognized its viral potential and some publishers even started their own collection competitions. Um, purely in terms of the image, the postcard offered something quite new. This was the possibility for a traveler to possess an easy to display memento, memento of their transient experiences to possess something that was specific to the place in its subject and its origin, authorized not just by personal experience, such as a letter, for instance, but by the place itself. So this is something that is produced in and by the place in most cases and available at the place that you can send to someone else. And recipients or collectors could participate in this having been thereness of anyone who wrote to them. Unlike calendars or popular prints in larger formats, postcards were handheld devices. So you could literally for the first time, you know, I mean, hold this um, image of a place that has been sent directly from there and, uh, you know, even display it. So as, as these objects sort of, you know, flirted with the boundary between a public and a private object, they could be held, possessed and displayed. So I'll go on to the next section, which is titled Cityscapes. The colonial fascination with visual representations of the city has its origins in the landscapes painted by artists in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, including the illustrious Daniels, William Hodges, James Bailey Fraser, Charles Doyley, among others. So I'll just go over a few of these images. Their work can be situated in a larger context of documentation of different lands, peoples, and nature. In short, colonial knowledge production that went hand in hand with imperialism. The images which circulated in print across the empire not only fostered a greater sense of familiarity with and power over an increasingly documented world, they could, in a sense, also be seen as agents in the production of the spaces that they represented. The city remained at the heart of new visual cultures and technologies, both of image capturing and display, that emerged through the 19th century, including panoramas, which Daniel White has written on, photography and stereoscopic views. Cities were rapidly changing, which meant a continued fascination with cityscapes. But the novelty of evolving technologies of viewing was no less enticing to popular cultures of spectatorship. So you could be going because, you know, the city that you saw 15 years back is no longer the same city that you see now, but you would also be drawn by these uh, new technologies. Both the panorama and the stereoscope offered immersive experiences. The former, you can see uh, an explanation of a panorama that was uh, on view at least to spare. Um, the panorama invited viewers to step into a kind of visual simulation of some faraway city. So you would literally be surrounded by the cityscape and the stereoscope would create the illusion of inhabiting a three-dimensional space. So when you look at a stereoscopic image, you see the image in, three in, in 3D. So these were both immersive experiences. On the other hand, the postcard didn't aim to create a transportive experience for the viewer but appealed rather to the desire to possess a piece of the world out there without needing to move beyond one's living room. And as such, it shared a curious relationship with other mediums of image production, namely painting and photography. As tourism memorabilia, photographs had achieved popularity in the last decades of the 19th century, and albums of photographic prints of cityscapes published by Bourne and Shepherd or Thacker and Spink were available widely. 
Edward Lear, known for his nonsense verse, recorded in his journals how during the winter of 1873-74, when he was touring India as a landscape artist, he had been caught unprepared by, quote, the immense commerce and population of Calcutta Ghats and had opted to secure his memories of the city by purchasing prints from Thacker and Spink. So there's this landscape artist who goes and purchases um, prints from Thacker and Spink. Predictably, photographs also appeared on postcards with brief descriptions of their locations as we see here. So we look at three, four, three postcards. The first is of Clive Street, Calcutta. Let's give it a moment. The second is Old Courthouse Street, Calcutta. And the third is the Botanical Gardens, Calcutta. Also predictable was the geographical bias in their representation of the city as the images predominantly focused on the main stretches of the European quarters, venturing rarely, if ever, towards the north and occasionally representing exoticized and voyeuristic views of rituals and public gatherings of Indians. So for instance, the burning heart would be a common image that, that keeps coming up. And, and when you see these images, you can, you can also tell that the people within the frame are sometimes distinctly uncomfortable. Um, since the rise of photography, several artists in Europe had started looking for alternatives to realist modes of representation. Um, since the camera could perform the task of capturing what appeared before the human eye more accurately than painting. Realist oil paintings, however, retained a certain prestige, at least in several Indian cities and princely states, as they implied the employment of formally trained artists, more expensive material and time to spare for sittings. So even though uh, from an art point of view, uh, from a visual arts point of view, artists were looking to experiment with form and uh, realism and move beyond it, there was still this sort of um, commodity value in a sense uh, that was attached to oil painting. Sometimes, of course, studios like Bourne and Shepherd would use photographs as reference for portraits and create very little representation. So, I mean, the sitting time may not actually have been uh, that, that much. In 1903, something very interesting happens. One of the most popular and one of the biggest sort of uh, postcard publishing firms, Raphael Tuck and Sons, introduced their now legendary Oilet series. Postcards from this series resembled, I quote, veritable miniature oil paintings, and this is from their own publicity, by the way, uh, that were often reproductions of photographs already in circulation. If you look closely, you can see the trademark at the bottom corner, uh, occupying a traditional, uh, I'll, I'll go to that postcard right now, but this is, uh, for a clearer picture, this is at, at the back. So this is where the stamp would be pasted. So you can see that uh, there's an icon of an easel and canvas with the monogram RTS. So that's Raphael Tuck and Sons, uh, and a palette with paint brushes. There seems to be no archival trace of the artists who actually made these uh, postcards and Tuck's offices getting burned down uh, did not help matters, obviously. Mathur, however, posits that by the end of the 19th century, quote, uh, quote, illustration was considered an acceptable occupation for women and many women who were already employed illustrating calendars, children's books, greetings cards and so on ended up in postcard design, unquote. Once again, it is entirely possible, this is a very likely scenario, that in the history of postcards too, Anonymous was a woman. And um, this is one of these um, postcards. So at the bottom right corner, you can see Oilette written. So it's very interesting to me that this sort of, you know, takes the traditional uh, position within the frame of the artist's signature. So this, this sort of... Um, method that Tux develops uh, in the, at, at an industrial scale, you know, sort of replaces or, or makes a claim of, of originality of, of, of an individual artist's um, input in this. So when we look at these postcards, we see, you know, the, we see, see that they correspond to the images that we saw before. So this is the Clive Street uh, photograph. You see the introduction of a motor car that wasn't there. But that apart, I mean, apart from the, so to speak, the content and the elements of the, of the card, 
um, the watercolor gives it a more washed out and more you know romanticized appearance in a sense. So one might even say that it's somewhat nostalgic in its tone, right? On the reverse, we see that it's part of Tuck's Wide Wide World series, each of which carried a unique serial number, no doubt for the benefit of publishers and sellers, but also of collectors. The oilets come with captions that typically perpetuate colonial narratives of the city that had gained prominence during Curzon's tenure as Viceroy. Here, for example, the name of Clive offered an opportunity to revisit the history of the black hole following which Robert Clive had captured Calcutta for the East India Company. Here you go. The next one, which is the old courthouse street postcard, which is strikingly reminiscent of an earlier painting and lithographic print by James Bailey Fraser from the 1820s, resembles an oil painting more distinctly with visible brush strokes across the canvas. Given its size, the length of the strokes almost gives it an impressionistic look. And finally, the postcard of the Botanical Gardens in Shippur probably marks for me the strongest contrast between uh, the photograph and the painting. I mean, freed from the specificity of a cityscape uh, where you have to capture certain details, the artist here takes greater liberties with form and color, giving the sky this beautiful pinkish hue that may or may not have been what the photographer saw. Although I'll move quickly on to the next section, just a reminder that all of these images are available for free on Wiki Commons. So uh, please feel free to spend more time on each. A notable exception among the cityscapes is a series of postcards based on paintings by one Frank Klinger Scallon, one of the few to be identifiable by name. Scallon was a Calcutta-born artist and poet who after completing his schooling at Cal Calcutta Boys School, worked with the Survey of India for nearly 40 years. He appears to have trained in France under the eminent painter and sculptor Jean-Paul Laurent at the Académie Julian in Paris and exhibited his work internationally. Pardon my French pronunciation. Uh, Scallon also illustrated a number of books apart from painting the series of postcards that was published by Thacker and Spink. So, um, you know, Thacker and Spink was by far the largest of, uh, of these publishers and, and to have your work picked up by them really is, is a kind of uh, recognition of how, um, you know, popular or how much potential they saw in Franklin de Scallon's uh, landscapes. So, what sets them apart, I feel, is how Scallon's paintings seem to convey a much more personal relationship with the city. In this painting, for instance, uh, this is of the pagoda at Calcutta's Eden Gardens. The building dominates the frame. Of course, I mean, it, it's, it's obvious and I mean, it stands out. But the viewer's eyes are drawn equally towards the dramatic sky, the trees at the back, and the shimmering reflections on the lake. I mean, it's it's a really sort of pleasing view, and and you know the viewer is is, is standing on this side, and there's someone walking across. And there's there's a lot going on in these pictures. I mean, they're very sort of you know full of life and sound and smells and all of that. It's it's a really sort of uh, immersive experience that he tries to recreate. I think um, if you look at the tux oilet. For, I mean, just, just as a point of comparison, we see that, you know, in, in Scallon, the structure, the building is, is not prioritized quite as much. I mean, it's not given it's this kind of central position. And part of that reason I suspect is that, uh, I mean, these oilets, although they, they resembled paintings and they tried to imitate paintings, they were still sort of working off of, uh, you know, visual traditions that were more prevalent in 19th century photography. Um, the next one, this is his depiction of the Jain temple in Calcutta, isn't quite as picturesque in the sort of, you know, in the aesthetic category sense as this one of the Jain temple, which is from the Oilet Wide Wide World series. Um, but his strokes and use of colors conveys a much greater sense of spontaneity. You know, there's there's so much life in this in, in his paintings. I feel 
um, nor does he spare the viewer the glare of the morning sun. So um, they are standing next to you know everyday visitors to the temple. Because he's not relying on the photograph, Scallon can add details to the temple spire that look somewhat vague in the oilet. So if you look in the distance here, because it's based on a photograph, which doesn't capture uh, the details on the spire, the painting also does not quite, uh, you know, it doesn't translate those details either. But when you look at uh, Scallon's painting, you notice that he has gone into those details to create uh, that, that sense of, uh, you know, of, of of a much richer sort of composition. Um, and finally, my favorite is his painting of the general post office during an absolutely gorgeous monsoon sunset. Uh, the viewer's perspective is positioned at the natural height of someone walking alongside the people in the frame. The dome of the magnificent post office, which was designed by Walter Granville, is framed by this burst of orange as the lights below indicate that the streets are getting darker already. So the street lights are, seem to have come on already in front of the general post office. It's so much more vibrant and lively compared to its oilet counterpart where, um, you know, it, it's obvious that this colonial architecture with the Union Jack flying high is, is meant to be prioritized in this, whereas, you know, other details sort of um, are flattened out. Um, apart from its rather flat representation, the oilet GPO also goes on, I mean, on the reverse, to reiterate the history of the Black Hole tragedy, whose original site was supposedly somewhere within the precincts of the post office. So uh, not only does it flatten it out, it, it also perpetuates that uh, mythography of empire, so to speak. Um, I will not go into details about the fate of cityscapes beyond the scope of the images available on Wiki Commons. In the mid 20th century, David Mordecai's postcards, photographs, calendars, and prints stands out as a rare example of well produced and imaginative curation of the city because, in a sense, there is an element of curation in selecting um, you know, the images that will go into your postcard set. In the early, in the latter half of the 20th century, some postcards and souvenirs celebrating Taoist modernist architecture of commercial establishments and offices in central Calcutta appear, but they tend to be again very flat and boring in their representation. Post liberalization, however, I, I, I mean, this is uh, speculation, but one can always uh, try and substantiate it. Um, with the exception of some artists like Shomir Bishash, much of tourism memorabilia seems to have turned to nostalgia with the fetishization of things like, you know, the hand pulled rickshaw, the earthen cups of tea, and the yellow taxi, and so on and forth. While there are several active collectors in Calcutta who have amassed substantial collections, archives that remain beyond the public view, such as the Mordecai archives, can enrich the study of postcards substantially by adding stories from the production side that remain elusive to this day. So these would include, you know, uh, archival material on how these postcards were actually produced. And, and there are fabulous sort of uh, insights into that that can be derived from these um, yet to be made public collections, perhaps someday. Um, so in conclusion, I mean, or rather before I conclude, let me point out that I have only dealt with one genre of the picture postcard. Apart from cityscapes, there are a number of other genres too that offer rich material for scholarly engagement as well as, you know, for the sheer enjoyment of, of perusing through them, such as the ethnographic postcards. Like landscapes, ethnographic representations have a longer history that goes at least as far back as Niccolo Manucci's travels in the Deccan around the turn of the 18th century. The collection of Wiki Commons has some remarkable examples as well, including photographs, oilets, and caricatures, so across the different forms that we have been seeing. Of particular note is this East and West series by George Darby, a contemporary approximate contemporary of Scallons. There doesn't seem to be much on him except a very insightful article by Projit Bihari Mukherjee, which rightly points out that Darby shared with Scallon a grounded perception of the city and its figures, both human and non-human, because um, uh, Darby really is, seems to be taken with the ubiquitous crow. Um, all of this is tinged with a satirical but a sensitive sense of humor. 
Another notable name in this regard is the famous Indian painter M. P. Dhurandar. Some of whose ethnographic postcards have become available under the project. So this is his postcard of the Bengali Babu. And you remember that earlier as well, one of the postcards that we saw uh, with, with the details of the collector's uh, fascination with uh, great artists and all of that was also a Dhurandar postcard. While it is easy to lament the decline of the golden age of postcards post the 1920s or 30s, it is worth remembering that artists in Bengal particularly members of the Bichitra studio at Tagore's family house in Jorashako, were in the process of reimagining the postcard as a site of everyday creativity and community fostering. Nandalal Bosho in particular appears to have set, sent hand-drawn and handwritten postcards to pupils, relatives, and friends of all age groups at a prodigious rate, and, but his senior contemporaries, Abhinindranath Thakur and Gavanindranath Thakur, were not far behind either. Although the printed postcard and the hand-painted postcards belong to two distinctly different visual and epistolary cultures, it seems unfair to speak of one without alluding to the other, each magical in their own way. So thank you so much, and I hope that you'll have a lovely time going over not just the postcard collection, but of um, all of the wealth of material that has been made available by this India Heritage Online project. And once again, my thanks to the Heritage Lab for inviting me to deliver this talk.